The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ben Nash here. I'm a co-founder at XY Advisor and founder of financial advice business Pivot Wealth. My business baby I started from scratch a bit over six years ago. In that time, I have leveraged some of the learnings of the XY community to scale the business and become one of the better known financial advice businesses for high income accumulators. You can join me each Tuesday as I have the privilege of interviewing some amazing people where I'll sell Obviously, be able to uh, continue my personal journey to improve every aspect of my advice process and hopefully you can learn a few things on the journey as well. Jump over to xyadvisor.com if you haven't signed up already to share and learn from other advisors or simply download the app. This episode is brought to you by Australian Retirement Trust, a fund that's more super for you and your clients. With more than 2 million members and over $200 billion under management, they have more access to super smart investments at home and abroad. They're committed to working with over 4,000 advisors and delivering a world of investment opportunities to help your clients live the retirement they want. Visit australianretirementtrust.com.au forward slash advisor. Include Super Savings and QSuper FUM and members at June 2022. Hey guys, Ben Nash from the XY Advisor team and today I'm pumped to be here with Josh Dalton. Josh is a principal and financial planner at Dalton Financial Partners. They're based up in Bris Vegas and have been going since about 2012. Uh, Josh, thanks for joining us, mate. My pleasure, Ben. Thanks for having me on the show. Mate, so I uh, know you get up to some pretty interesting stuff, so I'm keen to dive into that. But I thought maybe a good place to start is to talk us through the sort of high-level version of your advice journey. High-level version, hey. Uh, well, let's say we've been in business now for 10 and a half years. We had a big... Uh, a big Gatsby-style party uh, last year to celebrate the 10-year anniversary. Nice. Uh, hard to believe uh, it's been that long. But, uh, yeah, 20, I think it was 2007 to 2012, I was in the Commonwealth Bank, um, started Dalton Financial Partners at the beginning of 2012, just after I got married. Uh, wife backed me on that, God bless her. <laughs> and, um, you know, we just we had a handful of existing uh, relationships that we could take with us, uh, a couple of accounting relationships, and it was probably enough to get us started uh, and take that chance. So it was a lot harder, I think, back then to 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 get new client sort of inquiries. And I remember that first couple of years mm-hmm. just scrimping. I mean, I, <laughs> I got some pretty uh, interesting sort of legacy clients that's <laughs> on the books from those days because, you know, pretty much my only criteria for, for, for onboarding you is that you had a pulse. Um, but I'm sure a lot of guys have been through that part of it. And, um, you know, it was just a, a lot of scrimping, working from home. Then I went to a serviced office and then a shared office and, and gradually got my first employee. And um, I guess uh, we kind of just went along for a few years and, and maybe five years into it, probably a, a fairly big turning point was attending one of um, Jim Stackpool's Certainty Advice Workshops. Uh, there's a plug for Jim. I'm sure he'll appreciate that. But, oh, yeah. Um, that, yeah, that just kind of got me into the whole project management style of financial planning where we were looking at their whole situation. We were focused a bit more on lifestyle aspirations. It also moved us away from uh, asset-based fees to a, uh, initially a hybrid model and then a full fixed fee model. And um, we pretty much doubled our revenue the following year. So it was a real um, linchpin sort of moment for us. So the way that worked is we just started charging clients properly. We gave them more value. And we also lost a lot of clients that weren't suitable or profitable in the business, which was kind of weird, leap of faith. And and it's just just been kind of onwards and upwards from there. I guess the industry's moved a lot towards higher net worth, but that was probably somewhere we were always heading. We always wanted to be kind of like a family office type business. And um, that leads us to where we are today doing 
full-blown comprehensive advice, uh, mainly for high-income households, established business owners, self-funded retirees, and uh, people receiving large inheritances and uh, compensation payments. Nice. And how you mentioned the transition from asset-based fees to full fixed fee for service and, and some of the results there that happened. I know for me, I did that uh, probably about two years into my business. And I, I found it quite challenging because it's one of those things that when you tell, so I think we were charging maybe 0.8 or maybe it was 1%. I can't really remember exactly what the number was, but um, something around that. But there's a funny thing in people's minds where they think 1% sounds like not much, but $3,000 sounds like a lot. Yeah. So, uh, e- even if the the 1% is $5,000, $3,000 still seems like more than um, that 1%. And you mentioned that you you lost a few clients. It, yeah, talk, talk us through that transition, how you tackled it and um, how it came together. Well, yeah, you, you make some really interesting points there because – Sometimes it feels like it's in the best interest of the clients just to sign them up um, and, and and get things done for him because, you know, maybe you can't communicate the value, but the value's there. And sometimes I think, oh, it'd be better to present a percentage-based fee because it's easier to onboard them and that's the right thing for them. Mm. Um, so I, I know some firms who've gone actually back to, to asset-based fees um, and, and you know, I have an issue with them. I actually think if they're structured correctly, there's, there's nothing wrong with them. I, I don't think that it should be solely percentage-based fees because um, there has to be some sort of hybrid fixed fee component there. Otherwise, how are you um, pricing in complexity? How are you pricing in the type of client and the time demands that client has if you're just basing your fees purely on asset-based fees? So, yeah, look, coming out of that, it was always a bit tricky because it would it would test the clients, I guess, in terms of how much they valued your service. And yeah. pretty much if I looked back at the list of clients who fell off, they were exactly who I thought would fall off, uh, people yeah. that were always a little bit fee sensitive and they would switch advisors if we uh, did anything like that. So, yeah, looking back, uh, I think it was the right move, uh, but it is a bit of a leap of faith. Uh, I yeah. also want to say that I also want to say that you got to get your pricing right up front because I, I find it's it's so hard sometimes to have that conversation where you've mispriced a client so badly, um, mm. even if you've offered them excellent value. It's very very hard to uplift their fees versus a client where you've done it from the start. Obviously, yeah. And it's also um, a totally different relationship because when I look at some of the clients I've got from the early days, uh, where I had to kind of sell them and it was a percentage based fee, I feel. Still, they kind of treat us like a bit of a gopher, you know, go go get this, go get that, uh, do yeah. this for me. It's a totally different relationship hmm. um, that's very hard to change, the dynamic of that relationship once it's established, whereas, you know, totally different relationship with clients who've come on with the strategic advice proposal with a fee that hurts a little bit. Um, those clients tend to respect you a great deal more. It's a totally different relationship. Yeah, totally. I've gone through a number of different sort of iterations on our pricing and as you say every time you have that conversation with clients um you yeah it's a it's a challenging one and that's something that's always been a a a sort of a a thing that makes me think that buying a book of clients that sounds like a total nightmare to me because i feel like i just have to have have that conversation a hundred times with someone that's bought into one model and then you're changing the model on them and we actually just did this recently and uh, well, probably about just over 12 months ago and realized that for our more complex sort of higher end clients that we were pretty significantly undercharging for the level of complexity and the level of support that we were delivering. And we ended up close to doubling our fees, which were already about a thousand bucks a month. And yeah, for those conversations with clients, it's a, it, it is a real challenge because they're, they're used to paying at some level, whereas for our new clients that come through now, when they fit into that bucket, we just say, well, this is your bucket. And then they they understand, they they buy into it or they don't. But um, when they choose, then that's just the choice that they've made. And you just sort of follow the bouncing ball from there. Yes. Josh, what have yeah. been some of the biggest shifts for, for you guys? You've been in business for 10 years. You mentioned one thing there around the pricing, but what, what have been the other shifts for you guys? <sighs> Look, um, 
In regards to other shifts, I'd say that over the last five years, we've really moved away from a focus on on assets under management to more of a firm that's focused on strategic advice. When I talk to some other planners in the industry, they still can't get their heads around that we might be charging you know, a client twenty-five dollars to $30,000 a year for advice, but they might only have $50,000 in total assets under management mm. because the, the advice might be more around structured sort of planning around estate planning and business planning advice and getting themselves organized and getting cash flow heading into the right buckets. So they might just have a really big income, but no assets to really play with yet. Um, so there definitely has been a big move away from traditional financial planning. And um, that's provided a bit of a challenge because when you know you go out there looking for uh, other advisors, they're used to that more traditional sort of model. And mm-hmm. um, to go back to your point around the buying books thing, I totally concur with that as in it just wouldn't make any sense to me at all because how do I even know if I'd like these people? Why would I pay for somebody <laughs> And then I find that I paid for somebody that I hate working with. And, you know, um, on our sort of model, you know, this is this is a bit of Jim Stackpole sort of stuff is that, you know, our successful conversion rate for us is, is probably two out of three clients coming on board. And he always said to me that if you're signing up everybody, you're probably too cheap. Yes. You know, if you're... Uh, if you're signing up a very low percentage, you're probably either too expensive or you're not delivering the value clearly. But, you know, traditional models are focused around winning clients. And I still have uh, have had experiences where I've lost a new client because somebody's come along and discounted to win that business. And obviously, they weren't the right sort of client for me in the first place. But I just mm. think that's crazy. And uh, it's going to come back and bite you in the ass at some point. Yeah, well, I think if you're competing for price-sensitive clients, you're always setting yourself up for for challenging conversations. And I uh, was fortunate to have a good mentor early on in my my business career and um, I had a client that we did heaps of work for. Like There was so much work. There was a, a wind-up of an SMSF and there was personal debt and they're like all this stuff going on and we bent over backwards to work with this client and then they they ended up exiting, and I'd I'd price the services because I wanted to I wanted to do something that was going to be reasonable and affordable for them in the position that they were in, knowing that I could knowing in myself that I could deliver a ton of value, and then I I could see the potential for them for us to build a good long term relationship. But when they left, I realised that I'd done all of this work and hadn't been appropriately compensated for it. And uh, the piece of advice that I got from my mentor was to say don't you got to make sure that you're always charging commercially so that if someone does walk away for any reason at all that you're not um you know pissed off with yourself or pissed off with them or you know uh, bothered that you you haven't done the right thing and ever since that point I've I've always priced accordingly we we don't do discounts and I've had we work with a lot of people that work in tech sales and you know they they're generally pretty shrewd, shrewd sort of negotiators and uh hmm. you'd get the odd one that would press us pretty hard but we uh yeah we don't discount for for anybody everybody pays the the same price and that way we know that no matter what happens at least we're charging appropriately which is something that you know i I get a lot of peace of mind in particularly as a business grows and you're working with more and more people yeah josh what have been some of the things that haven't changed for you guys i guess when, when i started this business can't quite remember what it was called. I think it was called the Grant Study, and this was about this this old Harvard study about, I believe, um, you know, tracking these sort of Harvard graduates over their careers and what happened. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the Grant Study. But, I have heard um, of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a long time ago, but I remember it was part of my philosophy and probably something that stuck. And then when when they look back, they they talked about in their careers and lives what was important and. It was always relationships. So I think although I've, I've been guilty of shiny object syndrome in the past and, and thinking about scaling up and all that, it's always been uh, an important philosophy to, to me to be important to a small group of people, adding a lot of value to a small group of people rather than adding a little value to a lot of people. Um, that's why we've kind of stuck with this whole boutique approach of, hey, everybody here knows your name, everybody 
um, has a sort of custom strategy here. We're, we're picking the sort of clients that our, our service offering matches. Um, and that probably hasn't changed from the start. Obviously, we had to just take what clients we could when we began, but it feels really good now to be able to, uh, I mean, 70% of the inquiries that we get at the moment, uh, we turn away. Um, we are looking to partner up with probably a younger firm or maybe a sole trader who's looking for a uh, potential referral source where they want to deal with young families and young accumulators. We had we had a deal recently that fell through um, that was with another a young financial planner he didn't end up being the right fit for us, but hopefully we can find the right person. So just trying to stay true to that model um, of high level of service, boutique, uh, smaller group of clients. Um, that hasn't changed since the start. I like it. And obviously that's where the industry is heading, I think, as technology picks up more of the heavy lifting of the 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 other elements of what we do. Talking of relationships, though, you mentioned to me offline that um, one, one of the elements of your your comprehensive advice offering that you do uh, or that you have done is um, mediating like separations and relationship breakdown. Talk yeah. to me about how that all came about. No, it's sort of a tough area because when you look at Vassia, they actually use it as an example of one area that's a clear conflict of interests. Mm. If, uh, if, a, if a client who is a couple is separating that you can only really represent, you know, one of those couples. But I have had a situation before where I've still got both clients under advice because they were, it was fairly amicable and it was more about, hey, we agree it's 50-50. It's more just working through who gets what assets. Mm. And uh, he was the business savvy part. So he wanted the, obviously the business and assets that would support that business and and she wasn't into finances at all, so she just wanted the most passive forms of assets and both clients agreed to that at the end of the day. But, I mean, before that all happened, they were prepared to lawyer up. Who knows where that would have gone, but I do believe we probably saved somewhere between fifty dollars to $100,000 in legal fees when you look at both sides of that transaction. And, yeah, um, wow. yeah currently I'm doing another one. And uh, it's a, a client, um, when I took them on, because we do a lot of 12-month engagements where we'll just do comprehensive advice, get somebody set up, and then send them on their way. Some clients prefer that. And uh, these guys came and see us, saw us a couple of years ago, and we did the whole shebang for them, got their finances all sorted out, set them on their way, said, see you again in five to 10 years. Um, however, you know, she come back to me, one of the clients, and said, we're, you know, separating. We've been living apart for a while. And uh, we're just going through the process with lawyers at the moment. I need your help. Uh, around as, as a relatively large estate, a lot of investment properties. And she uh, said, I need your help to kind of figure out what I should be taking out of this, uh, which assets I should be targeting, what can I afford to keep? And um, we ended up engaging services. And part of that was ended up being uh, mediation because I had a decent relationship with the partner. But and, I, and, and in the end, when I contacted him, I reached out to him. He said, um, you know, I definitely want to uh, limit legal fees, Josh. I don't want to, I'm not greedy. I only want a certain amount uh, from the separation. Can we can we catch up and keep this informal? So I basically uh, come to the coffee shop as her. I've made it really clear to him that I'm representing her, um, but she's obviously uh, not in an emotional state to meet one-on-one -on -one with him. They haven't talked for a long time, um, but rather than getting really messy and going back and forth between lawyers because they're already kind of booking in this sort of structured mediation, we're just trying to keep it fairly informal to start with and see if we can get fairly close on the splits that they both want. Uh, and that minimizes a lot of this um, back and forth. Because, you know, you could spend $1,000 on just writing to a lawyer and a lawyer writing back just for yeah. a really, really, really simple conversation um, that can overcome that. And how do you charge for something like that? We have a fairly detailed pricing model now. So we work on different blocks uh, of advice. So, you know, we've got standard sort of charging for things like superannuation investments, insurance and estate planning with um, things like these uh, more unique sort of situations. We just kind of give our best estimate of what time's involved, but we normally quote a range. So I'll normally quote to the client, say, this is your fee based on this much time. And the client will normally try to work towards keeping it to that much time. So they'll do their part. And if it blows out, we just reserve the right to, to increase our range. Interesting. And how how long, how much time and what would it cost to do something like that generally? Uh, look, once you've been through it uh, a few times, it's not too bad. But I mean, in terms of the component for 
I guess, reviewing her entire financial position and a little bit of mediation between the parties. Um, I think her total fee for the 12-month engagement was about 19000 the mediation was kind of a bit of an unknown because it was unknown at the time whether he would actually come to the table with me. Mm. Uh, so um, the fact that he has will probably expedite things a little bit. Yeah, it sounds like a it sounds like a really interesting piece of work to to work on for sure. Well, it just beats talking about super and insurance every day. <laughs> what do you, what do you mean, Josh? Come on. <laughs> um, mate, what are you guys focused on as a business at the moment? Uh, at the moment, it's, uh, it's, it's been interesting because we have three advisors in the team and we've been trying to push to that fourth. Uh, we, we, we did hire a fourth advisor in 2021, but unfortunately it didn't work out. He wasn't the right fit for us in the end. So we kind of changed our model this year to uh, more support the advisors in the group already by handing off a lot more work um, to the associates getting a bit more focus on um, supporting advisors and freeing their time up. Uh, I think, yeah, our focus at the moment is probably the next step in terms of growth and just becoming a lot more efficient uh, as a business. There's a lot of processes that have caught up with us, so to speak, where they're sort of legacy processes that we haven't dealt with. And then Mm -hmm. all of a sudden our invoicing is just taking forever or claiming uh, non concessional contributions for clients at the end of the year is a nightmare because we didn't have an orderly process because before it was just a handful of people. Mm. And all of, a sudden, all of a sudden, it's 50 to 100 people and it's like, what? <laughs> um, so a lot of it at the moment is probably ironing out a lot of efficiencies. I've got a really good team at the moment, really happy with the team. And they, the culture here is really good. And um, once we get those efficiencies sorted out, we'll probably look at the next step in growth for us, which is probably to find that 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 fourth planner yeah it's amazing how quickly your processes get out of date in uh just just general course of doing things that we've actually just recently implemented a monthly look through it at our processor to just tackle them each in turn and it's amazing how many things come up that in a relatively short amount of time you say well that step's changed or that thing doesn't need to be there or this other bit's missing now yeah it's it's tricky to keep up we're fortunate in that we only really have four main processes that drive almost all of our activities but even then it's uh yeah it's one of those things that you you can't stop focusing on it otherwise it just sort of gets away from you i think this is the challenge as well with like if we were a business that operated on a bit more scale and we had more limited services it's, it's, it's a lot easier to to, to lean up and get our processes right. But because there's so much customization with these clients, uh, we, do a ch- we do charge a premium for that and we make them aware that they're being uh, charged a premium for that. But um, there's a lot of non-standard sort of tasks or things mm. that pop up that are brand new that are presenting real challenges. Josh, what would you say, what's been the most challenging part of your journey in business? Uh, trying to... Um, this, this, this probably goes back to the question you had before around the whole growth story and, and and changes in the business over time is when people used to talk to me about culture, I just thought, well, what is that? It's not even like relevant. And it isn't relevant when you've got two or three people. But when there's mm-hmm. like 10 or 12 people in the group all of a sudden, the biggest challenge in the last few years has been culture. And, you know, I noticed that started to creep in when I had started to see little conflicts, little little fires starting in my team where people weren't getting along or or weren't on the same page or maybe I did something wrong and I didn't realize it and they were talking about it. And that's become a massive focus in the last two to three years is trying to get team culture right. Uh, I've also um, seen people kind of come and go from the business where they were a really good fit initially, but then I guess they kind of, I don't know, it was maybe time for them to move on or we'd outgrown uh, their particular Mm -hmm. uh, personality or style in the business it just didn't work for the business anymore so i have to say that that's been a huge challenge in terms of managing people keeping people happy um knowing when it's time to maybe turn over some stuff um Mm. and just the general dynamic what's going on in the workplace at the uh, the time and 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 i'm always, always been a fan of that saying that you know the fish stinks from the head so also just kind of being aware of my part 
in how the culture is playing out in the firm at any particular period of time. Yeah, it's funny in the growing business in particular, uh, our business coach has this saying where it's like, you know, the bus is moving in a direction and, uh, you know, over time people get onto the bus and sometimes people need to get off the bus because a business can't really stand still. Uh, so things need to grow, evolve and change. And sometimes you've got great people, great workers, but just the business changes to the point where, it's no longer the right fit. They don't want to be doing that sort of work or they don't want to be doing that work in that way or um, as you say. So, yeah, it's it's uh, difficult when that happens because you don't always notice it and, and they don't always notice it either um, until it can sometimes turn into an issue and then it's an issue. And I don't, I don't know if other like startups <laughs> feel this way, but the way I felt when I started was that retaining staff was was a sign of success that people wanted to stay with you and you know I always had this ideal that hey these people will be with me forever but then you start to realize you know that everybody has I guess got their own interests at heart at the end of the day and you have to respect that and uh, yeah sometimes it's not a bad thing to actually have a little bit of bit of turnover absolutely Josh my last question for you is if you could go back to your 2012 self day one about to roll out the shingle and give yourself one piece of advice what would it be uh probably to price correctly from the start value yourself charge what you think you're worth and 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 and, you know for those new guys out there starting it's it's scary to to charge an appropriate amount but you got to remember for the for the people that you'll lose, you'll more than make up for those guys with the with the correct pricing on the clients that do come on board and, and buy into your value and your proposition and your story. So, I guess I would say to myself just to back myself, you know, realize how much I guess the pricing model has an impact on the entire trajectory of the business. Mm. Yeah, I think that's probably the uh, the building block uh, for a solid financial planning business. Wise words there, but if I could just add one thing, it's uh, ch- charge what you think that you're worth and then add 20% because you always, <laughs> you always undervalue undervalue that. And I know from like, you know, talked about all the pricing conversations that we've had over the years and um, you're always so nervous about that pricing, but you realize that someone says, like until someone says yes, and then it's just the price. And then, you know, a year later or a couple of years later, you realize that you still probably weren't charging enough. Uh, either so I think so much of it comes from the way that we think about the pricing and value or our perceive that we can't charge five grand or ten grand or twenty grand or whatever that number is that uh, often it's just our blocks as opposed to a something that's actually based on our value totally agree and I think that's where a mentor is important because you won't always see that when you're starting out you probably need someone to pull you in line uh, with with reality and 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 what it takes, and also get you thinking about you know what signing these clients up at this price means in three years' time for your business. Mm, absolutely. Well, Josh, thank you so much for sharing your story. You mentioned before that you're that you are potentially looking to partner with someone around that that's looking to work with younger accumulator families. What's the best way for someone that uh, that is interested to learn more about that? Uh, yeah, just uh, hit me up on my email or actually just send it to the office email, admin at daltonfp, that's D-A-L-T-O-N-F-P dot com dot A-U. Uh, we are capable of generating quite a high volume of referrals given our um, our online presence, our uh, Google ratings and so forth. We do get a lot of inquiries and, you know, it'd be nice to be able to send them to a planner that we trust that wants to specialise in that market. Um, whereas at the moment we're kind of just turning those clients away. So I'd rather refer them and perhaps there's some sort of partnership arrangement that could be figured out there that would include some mentorship as well for any young aspiring up-and-coming planners. It sounds like a great opportunity. Yeah, so thanks again for sharing your your insights, mate. Good luck with the, the next stage and look forward to hearing about it in the next chat. Thanks for having me, Ben. Appreciate it, mate. Cheers, guys. We'll catch you next time.